Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Wild Digital. I wanted to start um, doing a couple of things. One is I wanted a big round of applause for all the ladies um, from KL who've flown in to organize this gracious event. So a big round of applause for Linda and the team. <clears throat> We've done this event in KL and, and, it, and it's been such a tremendous success. And last year we had, this, we had a crazy brainstorm session. I said, you know what? Do you think we can do this event in Sydney, in Australia? Wouldn't it be great to go to one of the most beautiful cities in the world and really do something great for the tech scene? And the amazing thing is that everyone on the team said, let's do it. And I only realized later on that no, no one in the team had actually been to Sydney before. But you know what? Because of the beautiful ability of the internet, here we all are today. Number two, I want to thank uh, my very first angel investor, who's in the room. She's backed every company that I've been involved in. My mother is somewhere in the back of this room. So there she is, a big round of one of my mother. If any of you are seeking angel investments, she, she likes big, big bets with questionable promises. <clears throat> um, thirdly, one of the things that I wanted to share with you guys about was, so I consider myself very, very fortunate, right? I have of mixed heritage. My father's Australian, my mother's Singaporean, and I spent a lot of my formative years in Australia. I went to university, and right after I graduated from university, I made a very, very early decision and which was to move back to Asia to become an internet entrepreneur. And one of the things that, you know, one of the things that really inspired me was when I, when I looked at the great Australian entrepreneurs, you know, such as like Kerry Packer, the Lowry family, and so on and so forth. One of the things I realized about these great Australian icons was that very, very early on in their career, they realized that if you wanted to build a great disruptive business, you had to move outside of Australia. You had to move overseas very early, early on in the career. So that's one of the things that we did. And I think we've been very, very fortunate to base ourselves in one of the fastest growing regions of the world in the last five years, particularly. And what I wanted to share with you some stats is the mobile revolution is front and center, probably the greatest investment opportunity and the most transformational transformational sector in the world today. And when you think about some of the biggest companies being formed today, they're companies that can only be used on your mobile. If you look at things like Uber, Snapchat, which has just confirmed a 20 billion US IPO, WhatsApp, which was acquired for 20 billion US, these are services that you can't even use on a desktop. These, Uber doesn't work on your laptop or your desktop. It only works on your mobile phone. So when you look at the future of tech, the future of internet, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an investor, it's really got to be companies that are very, very focused on the mobile as the primary device. And I don't mean the mobile as a by-the-way feature. It's really about mobile and mobile first. So one of the things that we particularly love about Southeast Asia is when I look at the number of users of mobile phones in Southeast Asia, you end up getting a huge astronomical number. So if you look at Australia, for example, there's only 18 million people today with a smartphone. You look at all of EU, there's only 190 million people. You look at all of America, where a lot of these great companies are being created, there's only 220 million. So when you look at a region like Southeast Asia, today there's 250 million people. So Southeast Asia today is already a bigger captive audience. You look at companies like WhatsApp, you look at companies like Uber, they, proce they process more volume in Southeast Asia than they do in all of Europe. They process more volume in Southeast Asia than they do in all of the US. So you start to realize, when you read about these big market caps, Snapchat, 20 billion, Uber, 60 billion, you start to realize that a large part of that valuation is actually because of Southeast Asia, not necessarily because of the US. So it reinforces the point that I think if you want to build a great business, particularly and be based in this part of the world, you've really got to consider Southeast Asia as a great place to look at, to visit, to invest, and to consider. <clears throat> now, this is not a presentation about Southeast Asia, so what I did want to share with you guys is that a little bit about when we build companies, what are, kind of, what are the soft factors that we really consider important when we build great companies? Because when you look at the stats from Silicon Valley, there's 4,000 companies funded a year, but 15 companies take 
of the valley. So when you look at that, there's something like 3,980 companies who, if you invested in those companies, you're probably not going to get a return better than putting your money in the bank or putting your money in the stock market. So you really think about, A, how does one invest in what's likely to be the top 15? Or B, how does one start or create what's likely to be in that top 15? So one of the things that we've developed over the years is a, you know, and through trial and error, this is not something that we knew from day one. This is something that we knew from 16 years of making mistakes day in and day out, where we formed what we call the five Ps to building disruptive businesses. Number one was you've got to be really, really clear what is the problem that you're trying to solve. Every great big business solves a problem. So when you look at Google today, 350 billion US in market cap, Google, when it first started, was completely replacing yellow pages, white pages. And if you look at where is that industry today, completely decimated. So number one, trying to figure out what is the problem that your business is trying to solve or the business that you're investing in. Because every great disruptive business starts with solving a problem. And the great thing about the internet is that we solve problems better, faster, cheaper. <clears throat> We were really fortunate to be involved in a company called iProperty, which built the largest network of party portals in Southeast Asia. And we looked at what was the problem that we were solving. We were solving a beautiful problem because Asians are property mad. And the beautiful thing is that every two, three years, everyone in Southeast Asia is either buying a home or renting a home. So we knew that we'd be able to create a large, sizable business because we could create a business that at some point over the journey of a three-year period, everybody in the region had to use our network of sites, whether it's selling, buying, or renting. And I'm proud to say that throughout the journey of iProperty, we've, we calculated that about 10 million people managed to find a home or rent a home through, from iProperty throughout our journey. And that's a pretty sizable number, which goes to the more people that your business can touch, the greater the, the value you create and the greater the valuation of your business in the end. One of the things that we look at when we look at what problems is the tech world solving, anyone can go to Google and, and search list of unicorns. And when you see these lists, everyone on that list is solving a problem. Everyone on that list is doing something better, faster, and cheaper than the non-internet world was doing before. And the beautiful thing is that when you look at the unicorns at the top, they're solving bigger problems. Uber, transport is something that everyone in this room needs to do about 30 times a month. If someone can clip a percentage of that transaction 30 times a month across the globe, wouldn't that be a massive, massive business? And that's exactly what Uber did. <clears throat> Number two was passion. What we realized is that if you wanted to solve a big problem, it had to be something that you were really, really passionate about. And if you look at some of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world, the thing that unifies them, the thing that people will describe them, particularly anyone who's had the benefit of meeting them, will say is that they're incredibly passionate about the problems that they're trying to solve. If you look at Elon Musk, he's not trying to create a multi-billion dollar company. He's trying to solve, how do we get human beings to Mars? He's trying to solve, how do I get you in a car around the world that doesn't require oil? These are great, great, big problems he's trying to solve. He knows that if he solves these problems, he creates a business worth billions and billions. But he's not focused on the billions. He's focused on step number one, which is solving a really big problem. Which is very, very interesting then. When you look at starting a business or investing in the business, one of the things that we've always believed is that put passion first, business plan second. <clears throat> Thirdly, and this is probably one of the most, most important things in building a great disruptive business, is people. This is, I don't know if you can see Jack Ma at the bottom. This is, the first one I showed this, someone thought this was Jack Ma and a harem of beautiful women. It's actually Jack Ma and the 17 founders of Alibaba. If you go to alibaba.com and look at About Us and you look at who are the founders, there's actually 17 founders of alibaba.com who all live together in this apartment for the first year that Alibaba existed. <clears throat> so what we wanted to stress is that people is such an important determining factor as to whether you build a great disruptive business. Three independent studies out of the Valley have actually showed that if you have an amazing team, 
but you have a pretty average business plan, you will always outperform an average team that has a phenomenal business plan. So what it really came to show is that it wasn't so much about the business plan. When I meet teams and I meet entrepreneurs, like, why haven't you launched? Oh, I'm spending time on my business plan. I'm reiterating it. I'm retooling it. I'm re... That's the wrong mindset. The better mindset, just launch. Build, focus more on the team building and less on the business plan because if you have an awesome team, an awesome business plan comes out of that. Number two, not in every case, but in more cases than you'd imagine, co-founders perform better than sole founders. So when you look at some of the great big digital companies in the world today that we know, Hewlett Packard was two gentlemen, one was called Hewlett, one was called Packard. Google, two co-founders. Greatest startup in Australian history, Atlassian, two co-founders. Snapchat, two co-founders. Airbnb, three co-founders. It's getting harder and harder these days to find a great, massive, multi-billion dollar startup that is a sole founder business. Even Uber, everyone would have heard of Travis. There's actually Garrett as well, who's another co-founder of the business that, that obviously is not in the limelight, but it was an important part of that business's formation. So I guess what the message is, is that if you're investing in startups or you want to start a startup, you're, the chances are better if there's two, three, or four as opposed to one. And then this reinforces the third point, and back to the Alibaba example, <clears throat> is that 90% of game-changing ideas in startups don't actually happen during working hours. So when they looked at all these great founders, whether it's Hewlett Packard or the founders of YouTube or the founders of Google and said, when did you make these big, bold decisions? When did you decide to hire that person? When did you decide to allocate, particularly Google, 20% of work time at Google must be allocated to non-Google related projects. When did you decide to do X or Y? And more often they'll say, we were having dinner, we were having a drink, we were on holiday together, we were on a plane together. No one ever says, oh, it happened out of a brainstorm session at 2 p.m. in the boardroom. So what it goes to show is that get out more, drink more, spend more time with your team. <clears throat> Fourthly, this is, this is probably the most important point, and I think most of our businesses probably wouldn't exist today if it wasn't for this point, and really it's about pivot. And what does pivot mean? When I really think about you know, what are the traits that a great startup CEO must have? It's really not so much the ability to lead a team or manage a team. It's really the ability, the ability to have the confidence and the strength to say, you know what, this isn't working. We need to do something about this today. This isn't working. We need to have this change and retooled and relaunched in 30 days. So I really look at CEO really means the chief pit officer. And what does pivot mean? It's the ability to experiment, test, try again if it doesn't work. Take a chance, step outside your comfort zone, do things differently from everyone else. If you look at Gmail, for about seven years after Gmail launched, it still said, it still said beta. Where, where else, except for the internet world, would a product be seven years old and still say beta? Could you imagine buying a product at the supermarket, whether it's eggs, and it says beta on the eggs, right? <clears throat> The beautiful thing about the internet world is that you can launch a product and say beta, and you know what? Consumers are fine with it. Users are okay if your product doesn't work exactly how you want it. It's better to launch a product and get momentum than to launch a finished product, because you're never going to get there. So it's the ability to pivot. When you look at some of the great companies out there, what they're doing today is not what they were doing when they first started, was not what they were doing in their first business plan, which goes back to the point. And there's actually websites in the world where you can go and see the first presentation deck of Google, of Airbnb, of Uber. And you know what? It's nothing like what the companies do today. If you look at one of the greatest companies today, Apple, the top left, that was Apple 15 years ago. That put that, I think it was the Apple II or the Apple II. That desktop product now only represents something like 15% of Apple's business. More than 60% of Apple's revenue and earnings comes from a product that isn't even seven years old, yet Apple is something like 20, 25 years old. Steve Jobs was the master of the pivot. He realized that if he was to build a great transformational business, he had to change his product set every two years. Let's look at Uber, 60 billion US market cap, probably one of the most successful startups today. You look at the original Uber business plan, it was an app to help you get a limo. 
It was basically a nice limo service. There was no, there was no Uber X, there was no Uber taxi, there was no Uber food. It was, it was basically a service to help you get a nice luxury car to take you from downtown SF to the airport. That business today is something like 10% of Uber's business. When Uber finally pivoted to open up to Uber X, Uber taxis, in Southeast Asia, Uber is launching actually Uber motorbike, where you can get on the back of a guy on the motorbike, completely illegal, and the guy will take you to the other part of the town. <clears throat> so it was that ability for Uber to say, who we are today is not who we are tomorrow. I'll give you two examples from our experience. We launched a business in Southeast Asia called iFlix. If you imagine Netflix, imagine an Asian version of Netflix, but with a mobile phone as a device. We launched it as a B2C business, which basically means that the consumer is who pays for the service. I'm sure some of you have Netflix or Stan, and it's you give your credit card, you pay for the service. We launched as a B2C business because the co-founders, we hang out outside of work. We, we have dinner together, we get on planes together, we drink together, and we were looking at the data 30 days after launch. We realized, holy cow, nobody's paying for this service. We were spending obscene amounts on marketing. We dropped the price. We have the consumer price. 60 days later, nobody's paying for the service. At that current run rate, we would have run out of money in six months. 90 days later, <clears throat> after two months of the data showing us that irrespective of how much marketing dollars you spend, the B2C business was not going to kick in for 100 reasons, we completely pivoted the business in terms of focus, strategy, what, is, what are the founders focus on, what are the C-level executives on, and we pivoted the business, it was actually become a B2B business. So what does that mean was that in Southeast Asia, there's now three to four million people with an iFlix account, but it's not paid for by the consumer, it's paid for by the telco or paid for by the ISP. So for instance, there's 15 telcos in Southeast Asia who have signed up to pre-buy anywhere from 100,000 to three million iFlix accounts. And that was not what our business plan was based on. That was not what we hired. That was not what our marketing setup was engineered around. But we realized within 60 days that it wasn't going to work and that we would go bust spectacularly if we, if we relied on that as a business model. I can now say 18 months in, iFlix is on track for about 100 million US in revenue this year. 85% of that revenue comes from B2B. 15% of that revenue comes from B2C. If we hadn't completely pivoted the organization on day 90 of launching the product, iFlix wouldn't exist today. Another example was iProperty. When we launched the business, um, you know, we weren't very smart. We just said, let's just build a great Asian version of realestate.com.au and domain.com.au. After about two years, we realized that both those business models relied on real estate agents as the primary revenue stream and developers as a secondary revenue stream. When we launched the business in Southeast Asia, once again, we found very, very different structural issues in the market where the bulk of the money was in real estate developers, as in the primary market, and there was very, very smaller sets of money in real estate agents. So after about two years of chasing agents and almost following the RA and the domain business model, we started to realize that if we wanted to build a great, sizable business, we actually had to completely pivot the organization rehire management teams, rethink the mindset, rethink the product set, and build a developer-focused business. Whereas you look at our business today, it is the majority of our income comes from developers, very different from Australia. It's not to say that we change the UI or the core proposition. The core proposition remained the same, help people find a great home, but where we source the revenue from completely changed. And if we had relied on that earlier model and directly cut and pasting from the Australian experience, we would have had a business probably one eighth the size it is today. So pivot, never be afraid to pivot, never be afraid to test, never be afraid to experiment, never be afraid to say, this isn't fucking working, we need to completely change everything about our business. <clears throat> Number five, the last one is perseverance. And I think when you look at a lot of the top companies and a lot of the top entrepreneurs, they all say that it's never about business plan, it's never even about how much funding you have, it's really about having the ability to keep persevering when you think you have no money, when you think that investors have walked out on you, when you think that consumers don't want your product, when your ad spend isn't working, it's the ability to just keep experimenting, keep testing, try something new, change your website to red, change it to blue, 
Hire person X instead of person Y. Have everybody focus on project Z instead of project X, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's having that perseverance to say, hey, it didn't work 100 times, but we're going to keep trying and trying again, and we're not afraid to fail, and we're not afraid to make mistakes. And when you study the great entrepreneurs, not only in the tech world, I think a lot of them say it's really that ability. They'll never say I was the smartest guy, or they'll never say I had the most funding. No one will ever say that's why we won. They'll always say, why did my company win? It's because I didn't freaking give up, and I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. When I think about the proof of perseverance, every time I walk into a KFC, I always wonder, why is the logo of a really old dude who's like 70 years old with white hair? And if you actually read the story of KFC, Colonel Sanders developed his recipe of fried chicken with God knows how many spices when he was 30 years old. And he traveled all around America looking for someone to fund him to launch Kentucky Fried Chicken. He was about 65 years old before someone finally agreed to fund him and launch KFC. And that's why today the logo of KFC is not a young guy, it's an old guy because he spent 30 years traveling and he had the perseverance to just keep trying and trying and trying until he finally said, yes, your chicken recipe is amazing. I will fund this. <clears throat> From our own situation, when we first wanted to raise funding for our property in 2000 and 2006, 2007, we actually counted. We actually enjoyed the fact that every time we got a no, it meant that we were one meeting closer to getting a yes. So I had a little like war report in a, in a war room we had 74 no's before someone finally agreed to be the first investor in our property. So that was the 75th investor presentation where someone finally said yes. If we'd give it up on meeting 10, on meeting 20, on meeting 30, I probably wouldn't even have existed. Now here's the interesting thing. I thought that fundraising gets easier in time. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't get easier at all. When we started iFlix, and some of the investors are in this room, um, we counted. Uh, other co-founders, Luke and Mark, we thought that it would only take about 20 meetings to get funding. It took us 115 meetings between the three of us before I finally said, yes, I will fund this business. You know, and this is, and you know, we, we had a great, presentation, we had great promise, it was a huge opportunity in front of us, and you know what? It just took a long time for us to finally get to the right investors who understood the business that we were trying to build. So, the power of perseverance, it, you know, it, really, it really goes a long way in building great disruptive businesses, and, you know, and, it's, and perseverance is not just about funding, it's about hitting budgets, launching into new territories, getting a product out on time, getting a product correct, tweaking it, doing an IPO changing management, succession plan, et cetera, et cetera. It's, that, it's just that, it's that mental state that just keep pushing and pushing until the business finally gets to that beautiful place that you want it to get to. So in summary, when we think about building great disruptive businesses, to really find a big, beautiful problem that you're absolutely passionate to solve. Find amazing rock star individuals and co-founders to build that business with and solve it together. And, you know, and keep pivoting and pivoting. Don't focus too much on the business plan. Just focus on this great problem that you're trying to solve and just keep pivoting and pivoting until you figure it out. And if that doesn't work, just have the perseverance to keep trying, whether it's 50 iterations or 100 iterations. If it even takes 200 iterations, history has shown that if you're willing to put in the distance, great transformational businesses can be built. Thank you so much and have a beautiful time at Wall Digital.